me to rumble. Are we live? Hey, welcome to Living in the Scriptures Live with Brian, Caleb, and myself. We're looking at the last beatitude. Kind of sad to kind of think like that was a fantastic journey. But like I was saying, uh, as we as I began the sermon this week, each week uh, the new beatitude comes out, and I'm like, man, that's my new favorite. This is not my new favorite of all of them, and uh, well, for good reason. Right? Well, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And like, you know, how much do we really believe that? How much do we actually step into that idea that, you know, blessed are those who are persecuted? Uh, because of me and rejoice and be glad and I know that there was so many passages that I could have jumped into we were in first Peter chapter 2 but there was like three points that I kind of wanted to make that one this is disorientating two like you know what is happening inside of us and that was kind of the theology of suffering and then three what are we actually to do living as exiles and strangers because really what Jesus is telling us is that this is not our home. So maybe maybe we just kind of like recap those three things and how does that actually relate to us? Like one, it's disorientating, right? Like this is not one. How have you guys experienced this idea that, you know, like, hey, you know, uh, my citizenship is not of this world. My citizenship is heaven. Where and how have you experienced that? Like, you know, because I think this can be sometimes disorientating. I think that you summed it up really well when you said that the reason that this is disorienting is that uh, is is that our affections. I mean, we're born into this world, and from from our from birth, we we're we're forming our thoughts and ideas based around what we see in this world. And so, the idea that beyond this life and beyond the physical world at present in the present time. That, that that is where our true home, our true hope, our true um, identity and citizenship lies. It's di- persecution is disorienting because it kind of forces the issue. It forces us into this area of, okay, where is does my true hope lie? You know, as these, as these pillars of, of comfort or pillars of emotional, physical support, as they get taken away and chipped away at, and I'm feeling discomfort and I'm experiencing loss. It, it, it's solidified and it's, it's that uncomfortable transition where we're, where we're shedding our, our allegiances to the things of this world in this present age to, in, in order to find our hope and, and to come to a full rest in the glory that will be brought to you when at the appearing of Christ, as, uh, at the, and the grace that will be brought, brought, brought to you as the, at the appearing of Christ, as Paul says, you know. And I think it's disorienting because we don't ever quite perfect that in this life. That's what I think. And, and I've experienced that just giving up. Yeah, when you realize certain dreams that you have are, or certain doors will be closed to you because of the, the journey that you're on with Christ. Because of your, I mean, I haven't experienced a great deal of persecution, but my, certainly some of my social circles or or perhaps business opportunities, and I've just even chosen not to engage in them because um, I see it as a, as a, as a dead end. And I, I wouldn't, I don't think I would have success anyway because of some of my convictions. So, but anyway, those are some ways that I've experienced it personally. For me, there's a bit of a tension between being blessed for being persecuted, and that it's also a blessing to be to not be persecuted. So I feel a tension there because I I am rarely persecuted. I've never been persecuted in the sense where, you know, I would say that my life is in danger even close. Um, so I feel blessed, <laughs> and with some of the other beatitudes, I can say, yeah, blessed are the meek. I should be meek. 
and I have a tendency to think I should be persecuted, um, but I don't think I no. should no, long no, for persecution. Yeah. But for me, there's a tension. There's a bit of a tension there. Yeah. But I can sure understand why somebody that is in persecution would see this as um, something very important, very significant. Yes. This hope of heaven that there is another world mm. that is quite different from the one like you put it. That's a line, and this is a dot. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was a great. That was really great too. And yeah. I, I think that's that's the like the point. Even with us here, like like I said, you know, I emphasize like just how blessed we are to live in Canada. Mm -hmm. That by and large, we're not getting thrown into jail. We're not getting beaten. They aren't repossessing our our uh, our homes and our properties because we proclaim Christ. Uh, but there are things even. Even little things like you know, even just like you said, some of the angst that we might feel, even internally, that uh, makes me realize I am not home yet. And it, like you said, uh, behind all of that is this idea that Jesus says, "This is not your all, our ultimate home." And the more we make it the, our ultimate home, the more we feel disorientated. And then I know, like I said in my in my journal about a month ago, I wrote, "I am too in love with my comfort." And realizing as, you know, as some of the events around COVID come up, you know, some of those comforts being taken away and even that, how much that kind of like grates upon me uh, and realizing, you know, there is something like if, if there if there was any time in my lifetime that I have felt, man, how disorientating and how uh, much this world doesn't fully fulfill us mm -hmm. this has been certainly a time for me that i'm like you know this there's this is not the world that god created this is not the not what he intended and you know i love uh was it plantinga who says you know, it's not the, um not the way it's supposed to be was the book that he wrote and kind of how i outlining it and i thought that was a, a big one for me for, for me for sure but like I said, you know, now that we've kind of jumped into that, uh, you know, the second point really was, uh, what what does that do to us inside, right? What's happening inside? And we kind of I, I kind of walked through a little bit of a brief theology of sin. I mean, a brief theology of suffering and what it does to you. How you guys like you know what, have you experienced that? You know, in moments of difficulty. How has God been uh, present? Hmm. Like I, I, I sense with Brian also, I think that for us to say that we are persecuted or to feel like we ought to be persecuted, or I think that it, it's, I mean, really, we just aren't. Like we, so it's hard to say, at least, and I, in in minute ways, we are perhaps. Well, well let's just even look at it in just in suffering, like, you know, just as a theology of suffering when we're up against something. You know, so one of the things that uh, Scripture talks about is basically no, no, no cross, no crown, right? Like Jesus went through that, or you know, Acts fourteen, twenty two. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom. He doesn't say what kind of hardships or James, you know, through many trials, you know, will become. Um, how have you, how have we kind of felt? Because like, I know what he said, we, uh, our natural tendency is kind of an aversion to run away from suffering. And we think that like, all suffering is bad. And yet God uses a lot of that to refine us. I kind of feel like that the... The currency of heaven and ki the kingdom is faith, and the way faith seems to be built <coughs> is through hardship. Yeah. Well, yeah. What I was, yeah. What I was saying was just that, like, persecution is not something that's super evident, but we do experience, I think, in a lot of different forms, uh, times times of hardship, and I think it just drives. And I maybe I kind of jumped the gun with my first no, comment, no, but. But maybe I did too. Sorry. Well, no, but just saying that it, the effect that it has for me is it just makes me thankful that this life is not the only. Uh, there's a there's an age beyond this one. There's a resurrection. There's uh, you know what what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard. Um, there's something just beyond this, and suffering really tends to bring that into focus, and 
and hope. I don't know necessarily how to say it other than it, it, it shakes us free from the lull of temporary things and temporary pursuits, I think, um, to focus on what is enduring, to focus on that hope. And, and when we see it clearly, we realize, are you kidding me? Like a couple hundred, couple thousand more days and I'm going to be in glory with the Lord. And it's just the most exciting thought. And it's been, it's, it's given me a lot of strength and courage um, through some of the struggles that I've been through. Yeah, I think um, suffering is a great teacher because it shows us who our gods are. Mm. And I think you said that in the sermon, and that's that's yeah. definitely true. Yeah. Um, if if my my money is my god, then the loss of my money will throw me for a total loop, and uh, because my heart was too tied up with it, and so suffering does help us to evaluate where our heart is. And set it on heaven yeah. and focus on the things that are eternal and not on the things that are temporary. Yeah. And so suffering, you know, that's the beauty of, of following Christ. It's it's beautiful to be at a place where there's peace, and yet it's yeah. it's beautiful to be in a time of suffering because things are revealed that need to be revealed. So both the absence of persecution and the presence of persecution, or the absence of suffering and the presence of suffering, are a blessing. That's wonderful. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think of all of the times that I have grown uh, most, and usually it's in times of some sort of hardship. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I've often said that faith is never cast, it's always forged. You know, you know, that idea of metal, forming metal. Casting is when you just kind of pour liquid metal into a, into a form and then it becomes a, whatever shape that you got that form on. Mm. Forging is kind of when it's like pressed and, and like, you know, you'll, you see it in the movies. They forge swords and stuff like that and they hammer it into place. And I think our, our faith is, hammered it's it, it's pressed in um, I could I could share an illustration there from uh, my first career as a dental technician we used to mm -hmm. cast crowns the gold mm -hmm. from crowns and um, it would be heated up until it becomes Plenty liquid, more, or liquid to, yeah. to be cast into the mold and uh, when I was in my training my instructor said you watch it when it becomes liquid. First it gets dark because all the impurities come to the surface. Hmm. And then when they spread to the outside, it's, you can see your reflection in yeah. the gold, then it's ready to be cast. <laughs> and I thought, how, what a beautiful oh, image. Yeah. God he turns up the yeah. heat until he can see his reflection. The impurities come out and he can see his reflection in us. We start to reflect him more and more, yeah. but that doesn't happen without a lot of heat, <laughs> without <laughs> yeah. some struggles some and suffering. Struggles That's and suffering. First Peter talks about that, refining yes. like gold in the fire. So yes. it's, yeah. a, it's a purifying process. Yeah. Uh, what, what I find interesting too is that, um, I find it very interesting that this beatitude comes after blessed are the peacemakers mm -hmm. um, because I think those if you are on the pursuit of godly peace, peace with God, and helping others to find that peace, mm -hmm. I, I think that puts you on a collision course. And I think that there's a reason this is kind of one of the, if you think of the beatitudes as a progression from that very first one of, of, um, of, of being mm -hmm. poor in spirit with empty-handed and we've got nothing and and the work of God has it's 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 brought you from that place of brokenness now to a place where you are where you you are his ambassador in the world bringing his peace and even willing to 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 be persecuted for it what a great reward you have and the fact that it says you know it's the same blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven and it's just that's the same blessed as the first one you know so God's grace has been all the way through from the very beginning same grace that kind of saves you is also now making you righteous and, and making you a spiritual giant just like mm -hmm. the prophets it says you know yeah and um, 
and it's a challenge. It's a challenge, like, because I think we need to be, I think we, anyway, I, I just, there's a lot of reflection, reflection points there about, you know, if I'm not experiencing a little bit of pushback or a little bit of persecution somewhere, what is, what is, um, I think there's, maybe I ought to be striving for more peace, not to put any guilt or burden on anybody, but uh, that's just a reflection point I've had lately in my own life, so. Well, that reminds me of what I said this morning in our staff meeting, reading through Galatians, Galatians this week, how the last chapter right at the end, Paul says the reason they want you to be circumcised is really they're trying to avoid persecution. Yeah. Yes. Like, what, yeah. are we try, what are we doing or not doing in order to avoid persecution? Yeah. Maybe we avoid being peacemakers because we want to avoid mm -hmm. the consequences which might be a bit painful for us. And I think that kind of brings us to that passage, you know, First Peter chapter 2, where he sits there as, as aliens and exiles. I want you to live good lives, you know, do yeah. good. Do, and and such a, in such a way that even though they accuse you of doing wrong or they, 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 they kind of scratch their head, they'll still glorify God. And I guess like you said, you know, I think one of the litmus tests that I thought about when I was reading that was, you know, whatever we do, uh, does it point to Jesus? Does it make people want more Jesus in some capacity? You know, so either, I, I would say, either when they see us, they want to, want to know Jesus more, or they look at us and they think, you're dumb because you love Jesus so much. Yeah. And they'll reject it, right? Like, but either way, it's like, you know what, they see the love of Christ in us, uh, reflect it. And, you know, First Peter was written to a church that was beginning to feel the persecution, feeling kind of, I don't know, um, the heat, the tensions. Yeah. Uh, written right, like I said, if you, if you believe that Peter wrote it, as tradition has it, then they would have pegged it at in the 60s, which is really the reign of Nero. So when he says, you know, submit to your emperor as the supreme authority, the picture they get is Nero, and that, that kind of shook me a little. But, you know, what was your thoughts uh, around that, right? Like Peter talks about, you know, doing good deeds that glorify God, submit to human authority, live as free people, show respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, and honor the emperor. Those are kind of like how he kind of delineates, like, what does it mean to do good as a exile or a stranger in this land was there any one of them that kind of like grabbed you i think honor is a very important honor is something that um i know um i know a decade or so ago actually maybe more at this point um but bethel church in redding california uh, had a book and, and a bunch of material called a culture of honor and it really spoke to um, regardless of your position on the church, it was really good in that it uh, it really spoke to the need for Christians to 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 learn this honoring stance, where every person, every relationship we have, regardless of the person's behavior or anything, we can on. There's something. There's we have a an, an obligation as stewards of Christ to to show honor that accords to their human, they're, they're created in, in the image of God, they've got just acknowledging everything that God has made and put into this person, regardless of the choices that they're making. And I think that is a, something that we, we still need to do. It's been very temp, we live in a society that does not, I really think, especially just in the media, on the internet, it is such a dishonoring place. We dishonor those in in, in politics we, and authority and those in leadership, we dishonor, um, dishonor all the time. And, and, and it's very easy to get caught up in that. And it, there's, because it's easy to excuse our bad behavior or our bad, you know, our unwillingness to honor someone um, because of their behavior, because of their positions or, or, you know, how dare they, how, you know, they're so, they're so selfish or they're so negative. And, and we don't even know I mean, maybe a good example of this is, you know, how well do you know your wife? How well do you know your children? Pretty well, but there's always more to learn. 
so so what puts you in a position then to to actually cast judgment like that on strangers people who you don't know the story at all and uh and even if you did the fact is that god has called you to honor them and i think honoring the emperor i mean you you use the words supreme you know supreme authority and and uh i don't necessarily that maybe they're not the supreme authority but the fact is that they hold the supreme position and and there's a way to honor them and i think paul is someone who in his and how do you honor someone i think primarily through your speech you have to control the tongue yeah it's a whole another whole another um topic of discussion but james talks about that the tongue we bless and curse of the same mouth like how how can that be the tongue is set on fire by hell it is so easy to dishonor and that's the sharpest weapon i think that we use in dishonoring people is with our with our tongue with our words and so to gain self-control to master that part of our life and so we're, we're going to speak honorably we're not going to gossip we are not going to you know impugn someone's someone's honor and in fact if we have if we have an issue with someone we're going to take it before the lord in prayer in intercession because god is bigger and god um if they don't you know if they're acting wrongly it should it should grieve us not make us indignant we should be grieved for that person's you know moral state spiritual state and we should bring that matter before the lord and he may use us i think that honoring the emperor i think that that's stood out to me as something that just a continual reminder yeah. we got to be a people of honor whatever that looks like we all we all have room to and myself i have lots of room to grow in that and there's that big umbrella that peter talks about like you know show proper respect Mm -hmm. to everyone yeah and that emperor underneath of it and you know, imagine what that would look like if the people of god showed proper respect for everyone because like you said i don't know I, I feel like uh we're in a we're in a culture of outrage like anything ha happens like i'm outraged about it and and then uh, and i and i want to be careful and say you know what i think we can be outraged there are some you know injustice that we should be outraged at mm -hmm. Uh, but that outreach should be directed towards the injustice, not, you know, tearing down another person, even though they may not, you may not agree with them and they may yeah. be or, in a different space. And how much is it about tearing someone else down because we just enjoy yes. that and we get a, we, we feel good when we can justify ourselves. And then that, but that's the Pharisees, man, seeking yeah. to justify themselves. And how, and, how often is that our motive? And that I think that alone will make us look strange in the world today, right? You know, not not participating in the mm -hmm. tearing down of another person, right? Rather than saying, you know, yeah, you know, I don't agree with where they are, and you know, I wouldn't have gone down that road that that way. But we're not, we're not, we're not gonna, we're not gonna like cut them down yeah uh, and that's gonna i think that's gonna look strange and on that note of like emperor as the supreme authority that's actually the niv who talks about it nice <laughs> what about you brian was there anything that kind of jumped at you um this idea uh, of like doing good good yeah deeds i would say whatever the, the one side of it is not to dishonor but the other side is to do good so you're yes. actually going a, a further step you're yeah. not just not criticizing, yes. not gossiping. You're actually encouraging. You're praying for. Yes. You're you're taking a meal over to somebody or whatever that uh, that that might have hurt you, that might have persecuted you, that might have yes. insulted you, and um, that's 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 something from God. That's not something we do out of our human nature. So yeah, mm. and that's I think that when you look at the Beatitudes right after. Uh, the last beatitude comes that we're salt and light. So that's that, um, the impact that we're supposed to have on the world yeah, absolutely. in the midst of whatever's going on, persecution. Yeah. Or and, and that just kind of comes back to Jesus continuing to say things like, you know, love your enemy. Yeah. That it's not just a simple passive, I'm not going to, I'm not going to repay evil for with evil. But, you know, again, what Paul says in Romans, you know, repay evil evil with good uh and that's kind of that's that that's like I said absolutely that's like experiencing god's grace that's you know as peter says that's kind of what jesus did for us while we were sinners while we were 
you know, God denying, God hating, God, you know, rebelling, God uh, belittling, God actually reaches out for us and yeah. pursues us. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of the heart of it. And, and without that, I kind of feel like we just have to keep coming back to that over and over and over. I love the fact that we got to get, we're going into the Advent season and reminding that really, like, this is, this is God reaching out towards us into darkness and and what an amazing, amazing, amazing grace that truly is. Yeah. Is there anything else that kind of struck you along the way? There were a couple things, but mainly along the lines of, um, yeah, where, where you're going, if you want to continue on, you know, salt and light. And then some of these action things that Jesus continues to teach on in the Sermon on the Mount. I was reminded of a couple of those. You could see the echoes of them in that list that you gave from, mm -hmm. from First Peter there. And, <clears throat> yeah. Nothing. More All more. right. No final words? Yeah. Um, I don't think so. I have, I would like to say next week, uh, uh, I'm gonna put a. I'm gonna say it now, and I'm gonna commit to trying it. <laughs> but next week we may do like a, a bit more of an interactive deal. Um, when we do it this way, we're either too far away from the computer screen to see any comments, or uh, or it's pre-recorded. Um, we may try and go for a three o'clock sharp start with Peter, Brian, and myself at uh, at a different. Uh, just on our computers or phones and uh, with so you can type in and interact and ask us questions we may give that a try next week but look for an announcement on it at least yeah. if I we do that it'll be like a really set time so that our people can know so that will be awesome because like you said you know we'd love to hear from you guys uh, that's a big reason why we do this uh, and you know if you have any comments any thoughts you know send them to us and, and like you said if we can go alive and kind of interact with you guys that would be even more awesome uh, I would just say you know consider our Christmas giving campaign like I said we're giving to CBM the Salvation Army Food Bank and International Justice, Justice Missions uh, that was kind of inspired by like I said my son who's sit there and said you know yeah. hey what's the greatest Christmas gift that we can give like I said, no guilt, no cunning. Just you know what? Hey, I think we're where we live in a blessed time, and you know I, I I can't help but think of the Abrahamic covenant, right? You know I will bless you, so you will be a blessing to all Amen. nations. That our blessings aren't supposed to. God gives us those blessings, and they're not supposed to terminate on us. But you know we hold with open hands. So that's living in the scriptures live. This is life here at McCorn. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Blessings. Take care. Party on, dudes. <laughs> Great. <laughs>